Has anyone not heard of Octaber before? No? Okay, good. All of you know Octaber. Recording Octobre, in progress. Right? We have a few questions later, so hopefully you can answer them. Um, so by means of introduction, my name is Cheryl, and I'm a recruiter from Octaber. Um, I'm from the Singapore office, and I've been working with Octaber for a year and a half. Yeah? So today, we have this uh, technical workshop in partnership with NUS Hackers for the Hack and Roll. Um, and the uh, um, topic for today is uh, Introduction to Machine Learning. Hopefully you guys are interested in this topic. Um, with applications to options trading, right, and volatility predictions, and also sharing with you on how this can be applied to other um, generic applications, okay? So before we start, um, has everyone scanned this QR code? So when you scan it, it will lead you to a landing page where you can put in your particulars and it will get you connected to our newsletter where we will send you updates on events and latest happenings. So I encourage you to scan this QR code and put in your particulars, okay? Just give about 30 seconds. And yeah, I think there are some people coming in. Hopefully all of you have a laptop with you uh, because there is a portion of this workshop where it's going to be engaging hands-on so yeah you'll require your laptop so hopefully it's fully charged as well all right okay so an introduction to who we are so October we've been around for 37 years quite a long time our head office um, global headquarters is in Amsterdam that's our very first office yeah and uh, we are a leading global market maker with uh, close to 2,000 employees globally. And Octaver works to make markets more efficient, transparent, stable for all participants. And Octaver's mission is really to improve the market. Okay? So um, who can tell me what does Octaver mean? There is a clue over here where we have two words, opti and verhandela, which are Dutch words. So what does October mean? We have um, prizes here for anyone with the right answer. Any volunteers? Care to give it a try? Okay, yes. Very good. I hope you didn't Google it. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Um, great job. So Opti stands for um, options. It's options in Dutch. And then uh, Verhandela um, stands for trader. Okay, so that's how the word um, Optima came about. All right. So um, before I move on to the next slide, who can tell me how many officers does October have at present? <coughs> Anyone? Got a cool deck of uh, October pay cards to give away. Give it a try. It's just a number. Sure, come. Nine. Wrong. <laughs> very close, very close. Anyone? Anyone else? No, not eight, not nine. Very close. Who said ten? All right, great. And there's part two to this question. <laughs> what is Octavus' tenth office? So these are the nine offices that we have, right, in Austin, Chicago, Amsterdam, and APAC. So what is Octavus' tenth office? It's not on this map. Yeah? No? But that's a good guess. A lot of people guess New York, but it's not New York. Anyone else? No? Alright, I'll just share it with you guys. It's in India. 
We've just opened our first office in India and it's located in Mumbai. Yeah? All right, so just to share about um, you know, Optiver and technology, definitely um, with Optiver, we are driven by technology and powered by people. So um, you know, technology and data, it's really at the core of our operations, right? Um, we always see Optiva, sorry, technology at the forefront um, in order to perform optimally, and we have um, the best in class trading systems, and of course, um, the best infrastructure and very, very strong developers as well. Okay? So this enables us to respond to market events at very fast nano speed levels. Um, we also combine our industry leading automated trading with a very hands on approach where we can react very quickly to um, different volatile market conditions. Yeah? So let me introduce our trainers for today. We have um, Dr. Greg Saunders. Yeah, Greg's over there. Let's welcome Greg. So Greg is the head of IT education at Optiva. Um, and um, he's responsible for onboarding intern and graduate software developers, as well as outreach projects and recruitment processes for university students. Before he became the head of IT education, Greg was actually a C++ developer in Optiva, working on Optiva's automated pricing team, helping to develop our options pricing system. And before joining Optiva, Greg spent 12 years as a quant analyst in the financial services industry. Greg holds a bachelor's and PhD in computer science from the University of Sydney. So we have Greg today. Yay. All right, and then we have our lovely Dr. Adrian Ludek. Adrian's over here. Um, and Adrian is the Head of Academic Partnerships at Optima. And Adrian was from Perth in Australia and he has always been interested in prime numbers. Following his passions, he moved to Canberra to pursue his interests and completed his PhD in number theory at the Australian Uni National University. And after that, he started his career as a trader at Optima. So we have a developer as well as a trader. <laughs> and this has been a decision that's allowed him to combine his interest in math with his day-to-day -day role. And more recently, Adrian began his current role as the head of academic partnerships, which has allowed him to travel to different universities to share his personal journey with students, as well as discuss all things math and trading. Let's welcome Adrian. All right, so without further ado, we will begin our session. And a, uh, a round of applause for Cheryl as well, everyone. Thanks, Cheryl. Thank you. Okay, so I'm just gonna open up another set of slides. These ones. Can everybody hear me okay? What if I don't use the microphone? Do you, do you want me to use the microphone or not? Let's just see how this goes. So, um, there's a lot of pressure to come here and do a workshop on machine learning. Because you don't just endow or give somebody machine learning knowledge. That would be like me giving my two-year-old child an oven. The things that they could, they could do with that oven. They could do dangerous things with that oven. Now you have to give them a problem first. You have to give them something that that oven is for. And machine learning uh, is very, very similar. A lot of people go to talk to machine learning and they come out with these great ideas and they think, oh wow, you can do image classification. You can do uh, natural language processing. You can do all these things. But they have very little idea as to how to actually do it. Indeed, it only makes sense to give a talk on machine learning if we also give a problem to all of you to think about and work on. Now, the second part of today's workshop will be hands-on, there will be code, and the problem that we're gonna focus on is the problem of volatility prediction. And that is a multi-billion dollar problem. So it's very interesting to a lot of people. It's very central to what we do at Optima. So in this first part of the session, 
We have to learn about the problem. We have to learn a little bit of the theory. And then we're going to start talking about machine learning. But we can't cover all of machine learning. We're going to look specifically at recurrent neural networks, which have been very successful in volatility prediction. And in fact, the literature around this problem and that approach is really, really booming right now. So let's get into some actual details. I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of trading, and we're going to get stuck into some stuff. Just got to make this thing work. There we go. All right, so first of all, what is volatility? Well, volatility is a measure of how much a stock moves each day, roughly. You don't need to know too much more. Think about stocks in the stock market. Sometimes they just do this, not very volatile. Sometimes they do this, extremely volatile. That intuitive idea is enough at the moment, and we'll build on it very, very soon. So why is volatility interesting to traders, to people at Optiva? Well, it turns out that it is the key input into determining the fair price for an option. Okay, so we need to understand volatility to understand how to price options. Now, what are options? Well, we're not going to go too much into them. They're financial instruments. They're very important. Collectively, options make up a huge fraction of the sort of net global assets. So if you took everything in the world and converted it into monetary value, which is a horrible thing to do, shame on you all. But if you did that, you'd find that a significant part of it would be options. They're heavily traded, and companies and insurers and super funds use them quite a lot to, as a form of insurance primarily, but also for investing. So let's say that um, you ask me to price some options. Well, those options will depend on some stock. And what I need to do is I need to predict the future. I need to, say, I need to come up with an estimate for how volatile that stock is is going to be in the future. So first of all, I look at how volatile it's been in the past. I calculate the historical volatility, and I use that to predict the future. Pretty standard approach. Look what's happened. Use that to predict what comes next. And then once we have our prediction for how volatile the stock will be, we can plug this into something called the Black-Scholes formula. Again, I don't want to go too in-depth. I just want to really give you a flavour of this problem. This is what the Black-Scholes formula looks like. We won't go through it in detail. It's a mathematical formula. It's a Nobel Prize winning piece of mathematics. It's about 30, 40 years old. And like most formulas, you chuck a bunch of stuff in and you get what you want coming out of it. It does what you need. Now, most of the stuff we put into that formula is easy. You just read it off the page, you read it off the computer screen, very easy to find. Except for sigma, which is volatility from now to some point in the future, the maturity of the option. So that's why if we can predict volatility, we can shove it into this formula, and we can get out what we think the fair price of that option is. And if we think the option is worth $10, but we see it in the stock market for $5, then we can buy it for $5. So we can buy things that are undervalued, sell things that are overvalued. And um, in general, that's a good recipe for profit. So our goal here is to use machine learning to predict volatility. And we might not do it perfectly. What we might end up doing is showing you just how complex some of these models are. In fact, if you look at the literature, a lot of the literature is about comparing machine learning models to classical volatility prediction models and seeing which ones do better and which ones do worse. And sometimes machine learning, I mean, often machine learning is better, but the models are so much more complex, you need so much more data, and people say, is it really worth the trouble? So you're really going to get in this workshop a feeling for just how complex the problem is. So first, Let's go through a bit of this theory. We'll dive in a bit deeper into what volatility actually is. So a little bit of mathematics for you all. I'm sure everyone here is mathematically inclined. So uh, imagine you have some stock like that. The way that we get volatility for this stock 
is first we sample it, the price of the stock at a bunch of points. And usually these are predetermined. Maybe we sample every, in this workshop, we'll sample every second. So imagine we're sampling every second. And we'll call these S0, S1, all the way up to Sn. And then the way we calculate volatility, it's not too hard. We take those prices. Right, we're going to take these prices and we're going to divide each one by the one before it. And we can't divide the first one by anything before it, so we're just going to sort of kick it away. These are our returns. These are the stock returns. When you divide the price of the stock by the price of the stock one time period earlier, you get the returns. We take the log of these returns. This might seem a bit strange. If you ever go into the field of finance or mathematical finance, you'll always hear the term log return. And that's what we have here. We have a bunch of log returns. The mathematical theory around stocks and options deals with log returns. And we're not going to go, we're not going to go into why. There's a very quick reason there. But when you look at the log of a return, you're pretty much looking at the percentage move of the stock. So you take these log returns, or these percentage moves, and we're trying to remember what, what are we trying to do here? We're trying to get a measure of the overall movement of the stock. So we don't just add those percentages together because positives and negatives would cancel. We square everything first, then we add them together. Then we take a square root and we have volatility. It's just like calculating a standard deviation. Now, do you need to know this for the workshop? No, we'll provide you with code that will do this already. But it is important to sort of understand the idea. You want to know, with your problem, you want to know what the right approach is. Maybe an oven isn't the right thing. Maybe a toaster is better. Same with machine learning. You've got to pick your tool properly. And the only way to do that is to understand some of the nuts and bolts. In this workshop, it'll all be in Python. It'll be in a nice little data frame. It'll probably look, you know, if you think about how it would work, we've got these timestamps. They're all one second apart. This data has been chosen really nicely. It's really easy to work with. And that's a huge part of being a machine learning engineer or work being a data scientist, cleaning and preparing data. That is massive. Machine learning sounds like a great field. Go around and apply tools and get great results. But there's a lot of work that goes into it. So at each of those time points, we'll have the stock price. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Then we know we just calculate the returns, take the log of each of those and square it. And then volatility is just, if you add up all those log returns squared and take the square root, you've got volatility. So this code will be supplied for you anyway. One note in finance, what does it mean to have the price of a stock. Like someone might say, oh, one share of Apple is worth this many dollars. But what does that mean? Because we sometimes think of stocks as like mathematical functions, right? But really, stocks are a little bit more complex. If you go into the market to buy a share, you probably see something like this, an order book. Stocks don't really have like a set price that they exist at. You usually have a market like that. And you can see there are all these prices in the middle that the stock can trade at. On the left hand side, you have the buyers. And on the right hand side, you have the sellers. So the buy prices or the bids, you can see there's 251 lots wanting to be bought at 147. Okay, 251 lots wanting to be bought at 147 and 221 lots wanting to be sold at 148. So we have this nice little way of combining that information to come up with a price for this stock. We just sort of take an average, a weighted average of those top two levels. Okay, again, we've, we're gonna give you the code for this. I just really wanna share some of these ideas with you so that you can see there's a fair bit of mathematics in this field. There's a lot of stuff that you have to do and understand before you put these algorithms together. So to calculate, to smush this order book 
into a single number, which is what we're trying to do into this volume weighted average price, we do 147 times 221 plus 148 times 251 divided by the sum of those volumes, 251 plus 221. And this gives us this number or this price here, this weighted average price. And you can see it's closer to 148 than 147 because there are more buyers than sellers. And when there's more buyers, that sort of pushes your price expectations higher. You can do this in more complicated ways. You can use more levels of the order book. I, but we won't, we won't worry too much about that. And again, a lot of this code has already been done for you. So let's get back to the problem. We've now sort of seen, what have we seen? We've seen that there are order books. And we can take those order books and get prices. And then we can look at prices in the past and convert and get a volatility, historical volatility. The next step is predicting future volatility. And that's what we're going to focus on now, some of those ideas. Now, we'll fly through this because there are classic ways, classic mathematical models that are built for predicting volatility. There's one called Garch, um, which is generalized autoregressive conditional heteroscedasticity. Uh, I'm always amazed when I can pronounce that last word. And it's, it's a mathematical model. It's been designed for volatility. It works really, really well. And we can understand it. We can understand how Garch works. But anyways, there are other forms of Garch we can use. There are plenty of other models we can use for volatility. So um, I'll just list some of them here. Different types of Garch we can use, different realized volatility models. How do we choose the right one? Well, it depends on what you're trying to model. It depends on the dynamics of the stock that you're choosing. So different stocks like different models. But anyway, what are we trying to do today? We're forgetting about these classical models and we're saying, hey, I just want to take, I just want to use an off the shelf machine learning approach, right? I've been promised that uh, all my problems can be solved by doing it this way. So today we've chosen to look at, um, for today uh, we've chosen to use a machine learning approach these are some of the approaches, if you look at the academic literature, all of these methods that I'll list here have been used in volatility prediction. So all of these have been successful in volatility prediction. We're going to focus on the recurrent neural networks. Who here is vaguely familiar with what a neural network is? Who has ever used a neural network or coded one in before? Wonderful. Well, today you will be dealing, touching code that will be doing exactly that. Now, there are some good books out there, like where you build a neural network from scratch using Python, like every little bit of code. Um, because it might, you know, I know sometimes it feels like these things are from the future and have these, this really complex amount of mathematics. And sometimes they do, but it's mostly just linear algebra and calculus. The actual inner workings of these models fairly simple but there's just so many calculations happening it just feels complex but it all boils down a lot of the time to matrices and vectors uh, I should mention at this point actually a neural network because it seems like a lot of people are not so familiar with them a neural network is an attempt to come up with a computational model of a human brain it goes back to papers from the 1940s um, and these things have taken a while until very recently when we have a lot of more computing power now, but it's much easier to train more sophisticated models on, on larger data sets. It doesn't take forever. All neural networks are either just feed forward neural networks where information flows through this artificial brain, or they're recurrent neural networks which have loops. So let me sort of show you um, an example architecture of a neural network. You have some data. You have some data and you want to make a prediction. Maybe your data is like pixels of a photo. And you want to predict what the photo is a, is a picture of. Is it, is it a cat? Is it a dog? Is it a banana? So you have some input data. 
and these are, this input data is typically like a vector. And then you have some hidden layers of your network. These are typically mathematical functions. They are just, usually it's just matrix multiplication. And you typically have something called an activation function in there as well. Right, so um, which sort of, I suppose, makes small numbers smaller and big numbers bigger a lot of the time. We won't go too much into it. All the important thing is input data goes in. It's fairly simple and well understood mathematical functions happen, but a lot of them happen. And then you get some sort of output, which could be the word cat or something. This is a picture of a cat. This is typically how a neural network would look. A recurrent neural network has a loop in it. Towards the end of this data calculation stage, stuff from the end can go back to the beginning. So why did we choose this particular network for the volatility prediction problem? And again, I'm just going to hammer that point in. This is all just linear algebra and calculus, right? If you code a neural network from scratch, which is a good exercise to do once in your life, uh, you will do a lot of, you will just do matrix multiplication and differentiation. So recurrent neural networks are designed to recognize patterns in sequences of data. That loop gives the network memory. It can remember things from the past. You probably all have a recurrent neural network in your pocket. Hey Siri. There she is. Series of recurrent neural network. Um, there are other, there are many applications of recurrent neural networks. If I write an essay in my handwriting, and then you write an essay in your handwriting, a recurrent neural network will write your essay in my handwriting and my essay in your handwriting. You can do stuff like that. It's great at sequence, at sequences, predicting what comes next. So, um, as mentioned, the loop gives it some memory. And this is a more general point that I've sort of touched on. When we have a very complex model like this, and it's more complex than a typical neural network, sometimes it's very hard to understand what happens under the hood. And think about this, if you work at a trading company and you build something like this and you say, I've used it and these are the results I get. Well, your colleagues might say, but I don't understand how you got them. And so a lot of the time, you won't either. You just know that they look OK. So when we have very complex models, we sometimes we lose the power to explain them. But they typically can perform better if we do all the right things. But again, doing all the right things relies on understanding them. So I'm almost through my bit, and then we'll be able to get into the code. It's important to know, yeah, because we have this memory, we have this loop, we can represent very, very complex functions, but you probably know that the more complex a function is, the harder it is to train. If you have, the way that a neural network sort of works in essence is you have this computational brain, you give it some data, it gives you predictions. And you look at the predictions and you say, these are good or these are bad. You give it some number, some measure of error. And that, those errors get back propagated. They get fitted back into the neural network and it tries again. You're training it to do better. And you train it to do better by pushing it in the right direction. And that's this idea of gradient. You're pushing it in the direction of the gradient, so you're pushing it down a hill to where that error term is smaller. But sometimes we get very steep exploding gradients where we just zoom past our, we basically just zoom past our uh, minimal error, or we get these vanishing gradients where we don't move at all towards the error. And you see this sort of thing happen quite a lot in recurrent neural networks. There is something called um, long short term memory, LSTM. This is a type of, uh, this is an improvement on the recurrent neural network in a way, because it does, it was introduced exactly by some researchers to avoid this problem, and it does avoid it. But again, it's more complex, and we thought that R and M would be the right balance for this workshop. So, at this point, 
Are there any questions that anybody would like to ask? Any general ones about volatility or recurrent neural networks? Or is everybody aching to start doing a bit of this? <coughs> Excellent, okay, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to pass over to my colleague Greg, and he's going to run things from here, and I believe I'll need to provide them with this link. Yep. yep. So there's a link there for you all to go to. And should I go there on the uh, yes. top as well? Yep. I'll just leave it up for a touch longer. Yep. Um, and if you want to use the microphone, it's yep. that one there. Uh, Because uh, you extended the screen, so it's like a second mirror. Uh, right, do you want to mirror your display? Um, we can mirror it, and uh, once you're done, we can unmirror it for presentation. Okay. Tricks, don't you? Because <laughs> uh, I've been hosting Friday X for a while. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, is this uh, is it too small for you guys or should we buy? Uh, Just increase oh, it. Oh, I can zoom in if we uh, yeah. need to. Alright, I'm good. Uh, okay. okay, let me see if the. Okay. <coughs> okay. Um, <coughs> All right, so uh, that link is taking you to HackerRank. Now, many of you will probably have used HackerRank to, uh, to do interview questions uh, when you applied for a job. Um, in, uh, in tonight's session, we're just using it uh, as, a, as a platform to give you all a, uh, an interface to Python, basically. So um, sadly, you will need to enter a name when you, uh, when you go into HackerRank. I can't stop it from doing that. However, um, if you put Mickey Mouse, uh, I'm sure uh, we won't complain, okay? Although if you all put Mickey Mouse, then it could be a problem, but... Um, okay, so let me just uh, go in. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Oh dear, I have to relax my browser's cookie settings. Hmm. Uh, oh dear. So, yeah, what you do? Okay, doesn't like it. Uh, let's try. We can try. We can try um, Safari. Yeah, we can try Safari. Uh, what is it? HR.js? Right. Oh. Still the same problem. Uh, hmm. I guess we can. I can relax my browser's cookie settings. This also might be a good bit of time to get a bit more pizza if you want to as well. Yep. Well, have we got it now? Yeah. We solved it. Yep. Pack the mainframe. Uh, yeah. do you guys wanna, what time do you want to cut a break? Uh, oh, um, well, Greg, any, Greg's, any time that you Greg's in now, so. Yeah. Um, um, when I've finished my uh, bit, uh, okay, which should yeah, be in Okay, sorry about those little technical hiccups. Okay, 
Uh, all right, so hopefully uh, a number of you have already seen this screen. Uh, so if we go into the test there uh, and then we hit that button, uh, then we'll be presented with this. <clears throat> okay. All right. Okay, is this what everyone's seeing? Yes? Okay, good. All right. So, um, basically, uh, at the beginning of the notebook, I've just um, uh, basically uh, reproduced what Adrian has already spoken to you about. So, I'll just skip over that. Um, so, we talked about order books, trades, um, how to calculate uh, prices, uh, like uh, the weighted average price, how to calculate log returns, uh, and then how to calculate the realized volatility. So here we actually get to the code. So this first uh, piece of code here is going to download uh, the data that we're going to be using in this workshop. So I'll just run that. Uh, you only need to do this once, okay? So we'll just let it download the data. Just take a moment. Uh, now, if you'll notice at the bottom right, there's a submit button. You don't have to submit. Don't worry, we're not going to track you if you don't submit. Uh, however, if you do submit, it will try and submit the data, uh, which is you don't want. So if you run this next cell, uh, that will prevent it from submitting the data. Anyone not familiar with Jupyter Notebooks, by the way? Show of hands if you are familiar with Jupyter Notebooks. Okay, show of hands if you're not familiar with Jupyter Notebooks. Okay, there's a lot of people who didn't put up their hands the first time, <laughs> who didn't put them up the second time either. Okay, um, basically what this allows us to do is to, put, to write some Python code and execute it, okay? So um, what you do is you type in some Python code in a cell like this one here that I've selected, and then to execute it, you just hold down Shift and press Enter. Okay, so that's what I'm doing. I'm writing some Python code, holding down shift, pressing enter, and it executes the code for me. All right, <clears throat> so the first thing we need to do is we need to prepare our data. And if you're doing any kind of machine learning problem, uh, you're actually gonna spend a fair amount of your time just preparing the data. Uh, because the uh, machine learning models are very sensitive uh, to the data that you give them. The old saying, garbage in, garbage out, is very true for uh, machine learning. So the, that's the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna uh, get our data. So uh, firstly, I import uh, some libraries. Pandas is the library for um, dealing with what are called data frames. Data frames are like tables in a database, if you are familiar with databases. Um, or if you're not familiar with databases, it's just like a table. It has columns, each column has a name. We'll see this in a minute, and uh, there'll be some data in the column, kind of like a spreadsheet. Uh, NumPy is uh, something that uh, Pandas is built on top of. It uh, has uh, basically uh, the ability to create arrays of usually numbers um, and manipulate them. And then Plotly is a package for producing charts. So we'll see all of these in a minute. Okay, so this cell that I'm working on now uh, is going to read in the data that we downloaded just a moment ago. Okay, so it's a CSV file compressed using vzip. Uh, so this is just going to read it in. And then once it's finished reading it in, it's going to give us the first five odd rows of the data. Okay, so wait for it. Takes a few seconds. Unfortunately, the HackerRank system isn't terribly fast, uh, but at least all of you can use it. All right, so here is our uh, data. Uh, so it's a table. It has columns, stock ID, time ID, seconds in bucket, and so on. Uh, and we're going to start manipulating it. So this is data about a particular stock. Uh, I can't remember what the stock is, probably Apple or something like that. Um, at a particular time, each time ID represents one hour of data, okay? 
So each time ID represents an hour. Seconds in the um, bucket is how many seconds within that hour uh, that this snapshot of data uh, represents. So we can see this first row, it's stock 8382, time ID 6, and then we're starting at second number 1800. So we're starting half an hour into this one hour bucket. Okay? Does that all make sense? Yes? Then we have bid price one and ask price one. That's the top level or the most um, important uh, ask price and bid price. Remember from what Adrian said, when you have that order book near the center of the table, you had an ask price, sorry, a, uh, you had two prices and one had bids, the other had asks or offers. That's the top level. So bid price one is that top level price. Ask price one is the top uh, level ask. Uh, the bid price two and ask price two are the second level. We're not actually going to be using them today, so forget about those. And then the size, bid size one is the um, amount or the volume of uh, bids, the number of lots that uh, people want to buy at bid price one. And ask size one is the number of lots they want to sell at ask price one. Okay? Any questions so far? Good. Okay. So that's our raw data. Now what we're going to do is we're going to calculate our realized volatility. So in order to do that, we need our weighted average price, or Adrian called it VWAP, volume weighted average price. Uh, there's the formula there that Adrian went through in his slides. Uh, so I won't talk any more about that. And then we need to calculate the uh, returns and we want the log returns. So we're going to take the log of these returns. Uh, and so we can do that with this Python function here, uh, which is very, very terse. But basically what it does is calculates the log of, of each um, weight and average price, each WAP, calculates the log of that and then takes the difference that is it's going to basically take one and divide it by the one before it. And it's just going to keep doing that. Uh, sorry, it's, it's going to subtract. But um, in log terms, that's actually equivalent to division. So it subtracts, but it's equivalent to doing the division. So uh, that's what that's going to do. And then we can add to our book a log return column, which is just the log return that we uh, just showed you how to calculate, and a squared log return which uh, is just the log return squared. So if I, whoops, that's not what I wanted to do. If I scroll over here, you can see on the right hand side we've added a WAP, a log return and a squared log return column to our, our data. Okay? Any questions about that before I move on? All right. Okay, so now finally we can calculate our realized volatility. Uh, so here's the formula. Uh, just like Adrian uh, explained to calculate the volatility. We're using uh, NumPy's sum function to sum up all the squared returns and then the square root function to calculate their square root. And what we're going to do is we're going to do it for one minute intervals. Okay? So if you think there's an hour of data, 60 minutes uh, in an hour, and we're going to calculate the volatility for each one minute interval. Okay? So the first thing I need to do is work out what minute each data point represents. So I just divide the seconds in bucket by 60. And then finally I calculate my realized volatility. Again, we'll just wait for that to finish. OK, and here it is. All right, so there we go. I've calculated my realized volatility uh, for each minute in the, uh, in the data, I've got a realized volatility number. Okay? Great. I've got some data. I can start working with it. Okay? All right. So, look, um, one of the interesting things about volatility is that it's, it's known that uh, it's to be what's called autocorrelated or self-correlated. Uh, so, the, the volatility in one minute is likely to be close to the volatility in the next minute, okay? That's why we can use something like a recurrent neural network to predict volatility, because the volatility tends to be similar um, over time. It tends not to change hugely uh, uh, from one minute to the next. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just uh, try as a really simple way of predicting what the volatility might be in the future. I'm just going to say, all right, if the uh, volatility at minute number one was x, then I will predict that the volatility at minute number two will also be x. Okay? This is just a very simple, naive prediction of what the volatility will be in the future. So what I can do is I can just take my data and basically shift the minute down by one. Okay? And then I'm going to join uh, those two together. So we've got our realized volatility, which is the, the actual volatility, uh, in the first column there. And then uh, I've just shifted the data by, down by one, or up by one, uh, the way you're looking at it. Uh, and uh, so now um, the correct volatility for the next minute is in the target volatility column. So you can see that the target volatility is just the realized volatility shifted up by one. Is this all making sense? OK? All right, so how good is this prediction? We can measure the, um, <clears throat> how good this prediction is in, in many ways. One way is to um, just calculate the square root mean squared percentage error, uh, which is basically kind of like an average percentage error. Um, and if we do that, we can see that the um, RMSPE is about 0.3. So it's, the average error is about 30%. It's about 30% off, okay? All right, so that's actually not bad. <laughs> uh, if you're getting a prediction that's sort of within 30%, generally speaking, um, of the actual value, no, it could be worse. So um, we have a, a naive model for doing prediction um, and it's not too bad. And if we just, uh, I'll just show a quick scatter plot. Um, of uh, the prediction versus the actual. Again, the uh, hacker ink is a little bit slow. Here it is. OK. OK, so there's, there's a scatter plot showing you the uh, predicted value uh, along the y axis and the actual value on the x axis. Uh, and so you can see that it's generally close, but sometimes not, not the best. OK? All right, so let's actually get into some machine learning. All right, so Adrian already explained what a recurrent neural network is, so I won't uh, go into that. Um, but what we're going to be using today is a library called Torch. Um, it's based on an older library for a different programming language, uh, which was in fact called Torch, but uh, the library for Python is called PyTorch. But uh, in fact, you just call it Torch. So. It gets very confusing, but uh, just call it Torch. So <clears throat> first thing we need to do is import uh, some stuff. You'll see what all this is in a minute. And then we need to get the data into the form that Torch needs it. Now, Torch deals with data in the form of something called a tensor. Okay? And a tensor in Torch is just a multi-dimensional array of values all of the same type. So they might all be integers or they might all be uh, floating point uh, real numbers, okay? Um, <clears throat> so uh, a tensor is just uh, a, a multi-dimensional array of usually numbers. Now, um, the good thing about that is the computers are very, very good at dealing with uh, lots and lots of numbers uh, that are all uh, very close to each other in memory. Uh, so computers can deal with this kind of data very, very quickly. And in fact, something that can deal with that kind of data even more quickly is your graphics card. Uh, so if you have a nice uh, graphics card in your machine, maybe you're a gamer, so you've got an even better graphics card in your machine, uh, then you can actually uh, use uh, Torch to get your graphics card to do the computations and it will be faster. However, I have not attempted to do that tonight because um, it's more important that you know what to do than that you do it fast. If you are doing the wrong thing, doing it faster won't help you, okay? So let's not worry about the graphics card stuff tonight. It's pretty easy if you want to look into that. Let's just worry about how to actually use Torch. 
So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to take the data that I calculated a moment ago and I'm just going to convert it into a tensor. Okay, in, in fact, a couple of tensors. So um, what that first line does is basically take the realized volatility, the actual volatility values that we calculated and convert them into a tensor. And you can see I printed it on the screen. It's just an array of floating point numbers, 64-bit floating point numbers to be precise. Uh, and the values are 0 0.0016, 0 0.0020 and so on. The um, Y tensor is just the, uh, the target volatility or it's the X tensor shifted left by one, okay? All right, so now we have some data that Torch can manipulate, okay? So remember, the first thing you're gonna do with Torch is convert your data into a tensor. Now, when we're doing, uh, when we're training a machine learning model, we need to ensure that the machine learning model is actually uh, correctly predicting some results. And so the way that this is typically done is you will divide your data into training data, which is used to train your uh, machine learning model, validation data, which is used to basically check that your machine learning model is not overfitting the training data. Do people understand what I mean by overfitting? Yes? Okay, good. And then test data, which is what you will actually test the model to see if it actually works on, okay? And the important thing to understand is that the um, machine learning model should never see the test data while you are building the model. If the machine learning model sees the test data while you're building the model, then it's almost guaranteed to be at least partially overfitted to the data it's been trained on, okay? Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to divide my data into three sets. Training data, validation data, that's data used to check that we're overfitting, and then test data. And the way I've done that is I've just said, okay, we'll use the first half of the data for the training data, the next 25% for the validation data, and the rest of the data for the test data. Is this making sense? Good, okay. All right, so <clears throat> now we need to get the data in a form uh, that is easy to use. And Torch provides us with a couple of classes that make the data easy to use. The first is data set, uh, which basically um, is a container containing uh, the training data or the sample data and the correct output, okay, or, or the correct prediction, the correct result whatever you want to call it, okay? So here uh, in this line, you can see I'm creating a, a, a data set from a tensor, and the first argument is the, the samples that I'm going to use uh, to train it, and the second argument is the correct output, okay? All right, and the second class that um, uh, Torch provides us is called data loader, um, data loader, basically what that does is make it really easy to iterate over the data. Okay, so we, we're, we're going to write a for loop in a little while which will iterate over the data and data loader makes it really easy to do that. Now, uh, if you look at the Torch documentation, you can actually create your own subclasses of data set and data loader. Uh, so, for example, if you have a huge set of data that won't all fit in memory at the same time, you could write a subclass of data set which loaded it from disk every time it needed the next chunk of data or even loaded it from a network every time it needed the next chunk of data. Um, but for ten the purposes of tonight's exercise, we'll just use a data set based on these tensors we've already created. So I've got a, a data set and a data loader for the training data, the validation data, and the test data. Oops. Uh, that's not what I wanted. Oh. Uh, what has happened here? Have I done something wrong? I forgot to run that. What have I? There we go. Oh dear. Okay, sorry, it appears to have uh, lost all of my input for some reason, so I'll just do it again. 
Uh, so just bear with me for a moment. Okay, <clears throat> so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to create our neural network. So this is where we actually start building a neural network in Torch. Um, oops, it has, there we go, let's go off there. So to create a neural network, we just define a class like the one you can see on the screen now. Um, it has to be a subclass of the module class from the torch.nn uh, module. So uh, just be aware in Python, a module is uh, a, a, a library of code that can be imported. That's what Python means by module. In Torch, a module is uh, basically a, a, a network. Uh, okay. Um, so uh, uh, just be aware of that uh, overriding of the term module. So in our simple RNN class, uh, we just uh, call the superclasses init function to initialize the module. Uh, we remember what the hidden size is and then we create two layers for our neural network. So this is a very simple neural network. It only has two layers. One is the recurrent layer, the RNN, and the second is what's called a fully connected layer. Uh, a fully connected layer basically takes its inputs and uh, from all of those inputs, it um, uh, goes to uh, one or more outputs. So, uh, I wonder if I can draw this over here. Sorry to those who are online, but uh, we, we have uh, an input here, uh, and then we have an input here, and then that might go to our recurrent layer here, and then uh, that goes to a fully connected layer, which will go to some outputs, probably outputs they might be. Uh, that's what it like. Okay, so that's what we're doing. We're creating a, uh, a neural network with two layers, uh, a recurrent layer, and a fully connected layer. Um, and the size of, or the number of nodes in each layer, is determined by the arguments to the constructor. So the input size is how many inputs there are going to be. The output size is how many outputs there are going to be. And then the hidden size is the size of the hidden layer in the recurrent neural network. The next thing we do is we define this forward function. And this basically tells us how to feed the data forward through the network. So we're, when we've got a new piece of data that we want to put through our neural network, this forward method will be called. And what we're going to do is we're going to firstly put the data into our <coughs> recurrent layer. Okay, that's what this line does, puts the data into the recurrent layer. And then we're going to uh, basically convert that output into um, just essentially a vector uh, so that we can put it into our fully connected layer. And then whatever the fully connected layer spits out, that is our output. Okay? So that's, we've just defined a neural network using Torch. Okay, with a recurrent layer and a fully connected layer, okay? All right, so now we can actually create one of these and once again, it's lost, what is going on? Oh, okay. I'm very sorry, I don't know what's going on here. It's lost all my uh, inputs again, so I'll have to just go through that quickly again. Okay. Okay, <clears throat> so 
So we've just defined our neural network. Now we have to train it. Okay? So how do you train a neural network? Well, basically, what you do is you take some in input data, you put it through the network, and the network will give you an output. The output is almost certainly wrong. Okay? So how do we deal with the fact that the output is wrong? And the answer is that we basically work out how much it's wrong, how far is it wrong, or what's called the loss, the difference between the correct output and the output that we got. And then <clears throat> we work backward through the network, adjusting the parameters of the network so that the output will be closer to the correct input. Okay? Does anyone want me to explain that again? No? Yes, someone does. Okay. So if I look at my little diagram here, I might give it some input, maybe I'll give it the number three. Okay, it's going to go through my neural network. Now, at each of these uh, arrows here, there's going to be some kind of weight, okay, that'll be applied to the input. And then at these nodes, there'll be an activation function, as Adrian described earlier. And the activation function, what that basically has the effect of doing is, uh, as Adrian explained, amplifying larger values and minimizing smaller values is, is a typical sort of activation function. The reason why you want to do that is because um, if you don't have uh, an activation function, if you just have uh, like weights, W1, W2, W3, and so on, then essentially this just becomes multiplication, right? It's just, you can just combine the weights and just do a single multiplication rather than uh, multiple ones. So by having an activation function, uh, you're sort of determining which nodes actually get uh, used and which don't. Uh, and so if they have larger input values, they'll be used. If they have smaller input values, they might not. And eventually, uh, you'll come through and you'll get some outputs out the end here. Uh, and so the outputs might be in a request O, whatever you want to call it, O1, O2. And then what we need to do is we need to adjust these weights so that given this input, we get something closer to the correct output. Okay? That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to adjust the weights to get closer to the correct output. That's how a neural network works. Okay? So um, the way that we do that uh, is firstly we have to have a way of measuring how far away from the correct um, answer that the actual answer that we got out of our neural network was. That's called the loss function or the criterion. Here I'm using uh, MSE loss, which is mean squared error. Okay? Uh, mean squared error is appropriate for this kind of problem because it's, it's just numbers. We're, we're doing something called regression. We're trying to predict the value of a, of a function or something like a function uh, which has uh, uh, numerical results. Uh, so the mean squared error is appropriate here. Uh, and then we need, all right, uh, just a little bit longer. All right, so we, we took our data that was originally in a, uh, in a pandas data frame and we converted it into a tensor, okay, uh, which is the data structure that uh, Torch requires. We then uh, basically pop that tensor into a data set and pop that data set into a data loader uh, so that we can conveniently manipulate that data uh, when we're training our model. Next thing we did was we created our model, which uh, was a neural network consisting of two layers. One is a recurrent layer with some number of inputs and uh, some number of hidden nodes. And the second is our fully connected layer, uh, which takes those hidden nodes basically and converts it into a an output of whatever size we want. So, in fact, uh, with, I've specified the size in this uh, uh, cell at the top of the screen here. So our input size is one. We're going to take one realized volatility number, which is the realized volatility over a one-minute period, 
and we're using it to try to predict what the realized volatility will be in the next minute. Okay? So our neural network has one input, it has one output, and it has some number of hidden nodes, and the number of hidden nodes is uh, 64. Okay? All right. So now, how do we train the model? And here's the code to train the model. So in each epoch, we're going to go through all the training data. We're going to feed it into our neural network, figure out how wrong the neural network was, and then adjust the weights in the neural network so that it's less wrong. <laughs> OK? And hopefully, after doing this lots and lots of times, the neural network will give us predictions which are pretty close to the actual uh, result that we want. OK? Um, so how does the training, what does the training loop look like? So we've got our four e epoch in range epochs. That's just going over the number of epochs that we define. The model.train line uh, just tells the model to go into training mode. OK, so uh, training mode, it does some extra stuff that it wouldn't do if we were uh, using it for evaluation. And then the for realized target in train DL is going to go through the training data from the training data loader that we created earlier. Uh, the realized is um, basically the uh, realized volatilities. And the target is the correct output, okay, the, or the output that we want, which is the volatility for the next minute, okay? So realized is the volatility for minutes one, two, three. Target is the volatilities for minutes two, three, four, okay? That make sense? I'll assume it does. Okay, so now what we do is we zero out our optimizer. We call optimizer.zero.grad, which clears the optimizer. Uh, of any, any data that might have had in the previous iteration. We get the output from our model. That's the out equals model line is um, basically putting the input into the model and getting some output. That output's almost certainly going to be wrong. So we measure how wrong it is with the loss equals criterion line. And then we uh, basically the loss or backward line basically works backward through the neural network, calculating the gradients at each different point, uh, which the optimizer can then use. That's in the optimizer.step line to adjust the weights to try to minimize the loss. Okay? Uh, and then we've got this train loss, which is we're just adding up the total loss. Uh, we're going to print it out later. And hopefully, at the end of each epoch, the loss gets lower. So what, ideally what we want is that the loss we see after epoch number one is higher than the loss we see after epoch number two, three, and so on. That means that our training is working. Okay? Any questions before I move on? Okay, so the next thing that this loop does is the validation step. Um, this basically we put the model into evaluation mode because we're not training it. We're using the model um, to make some predictions. Uh, and then we use our validation data in our valid underscore DL data loader. Uh, we calculate the output of the model given that data, work out the loss, how far away from the correct answer. Uh, or the desired answer is the uh, output of the model. And then we um, uh, calculate the average uh, validation loss or the average loss in the validation step. And the idea is that um, by using data that we haven't trained the model on, uh, we're checking to see that we're not overfitting the model, that the model is not overfitting the data. So again, what we want to see is that the val validation loss, the loss in the validation step, gets lower and lower with each epoch. <coughs> if we see the training uh, loss getting lower with each epoch, but the validation loss doesn't or even gets higher with each epoch, that means the model's overfitting. Okay? 
Um, so that's why we do the validation step. Okay, so that's what this loop will do, is it'll, it'll train our model. So let's hope this works. Okay, it's working. So we'll wait for a minute, just to uh, wait for it to print out something. This is a step that would be a lot faster if we had a graphics card. Sadly, we don't in, uh, in HackerRank. I think maybe the previous cell hasn't even ex finished exit. Oh, really? <coughs> oh, yes. Oh, dear. <coughs> I mean, you could always just ask them if it's working for any of them. Yeah. <coughs> managed to do it. Has anyone run this cell and it, did it work for you? No, it didn't work for you either. It, did it work for anyone? That cell? Did anyone train it through the, over the epochs? Yeah. Yeah. Did it work for you? Yeah. Okay. What happened to the uh, training loss? Did it get better or worse? Stayed the same? Okay. So from the first epoch to the second, it got worse as in bigger, and then, uh, and then later it got a bit smaller and then it stayed about the same. What about the validation loss? The validation loss, um, it fluctuates. Yeah, it fluctuates, yep. Okay, so what that's telling us is that this model isn't doing as good a job as we would like to predict the volatility. Um, so uh, that's where the remainder of this uh, workshop comes in is that you all have uh, hopefully in front of you a, a working uh, Jupyter notebook and you can make some changes to the model and see if you can get it to do better and Adrian and I will be around to answer questions while you're doing that okay um, so uh, I can't it's not working here for me but I'll just show you the next uh, step uh, the next step is here in this cell here we're just using the, um, the model to uh, make some predictions based on the, the test data. Remember the test data is data that the model has never seen and so we're using it to check if the model can actually make some predictions. Based on the results of the training, it's not going to make very good predictions, right? So hopefully if you can make some improvements to the model, <coughs> excuse me, then it should, uh, this test step should give better results. Um, and then uh, this step here, we're just measuring how close uh, the predictions are to the actuals, just like we did for the naive model uh, earlier on. Okay? And so we've got some, uh, some advice here <coughs> about steps you can take to possibly improve the model. So does the network have the right amount of capacity? So um, is the hidden size lar too large, too small? Uh, should there be uh, additional layers in the neural network? Maybe that would help improve the results. Uh, is the input normalised? Someone asked me about this during the break. Um, in this particular case, um, we're using log returns, uh, which are all numbers reasonably close to zero. Uh, so we probably aren't going to gain much by normalising the, da the data for this particular problem. But uh, in a normal machine learning problem, you would want to make sure the data is normalized uh, so that um, uh, the machine the learning model uh, doesn't get surprised with data which is substantially larger or smaller than the data it was trained with. Um, <clears throat> did you initialize the weights properly? Uh, so fortunately, in this case, we just let the uh, system initialize all the weights. But you might be able to uh, uh, supply something better. Have you chosen a good loss function? Is there a better loss function? Maybe you can change that. Uh, have you chosen a, a good optimization algorithm? Maybe you could choose a different one. Uh, are your hyperparameters suitable? So to give an example of that, um, here in this cell, when we created the optimizer, we set the learning rate, yeah, that's the LR at the end there, to 0 0.01. Now the learning rate tells it how fast to learn 
So <clears throat> at each time, at each step, um, how much closer to the um, correct answer should it try and get? <coughs> if it tries uh, to move towards the correct answer too fast, then you'll get wild swings uh, in the weights and um, uh, it'll probably uh, not produce very good answers um, and it might well overfit. Um, but if the learning rate is too small, then it will take too long to learn anything because it only adjusts the weights by a very small amount in each iteration. So you could adjust that and see if it does any better. Of course, you could increase the number of epochs. Um, that would be something you could try. Um, <clears throat> could you supply additional input data? Uh, so uh, one idea would be to say, instead of using the last minute's realized volatility to predict the next minute's realized volatility, maybe we take the last five minutes and use it to predict the next one minute, okay? Or the, next, or the last 30 minutes and use it to predict the next one minute. That would be another idea. So uh, you've all got the code hopefully in front of you. Hopefully your hacker rank is working. Um, and uh, what we want you to do basically for the remainder of our time is have a go at tweaking some parameters model, see if you can get it to produce better results. Uh, and as I said, Adrian and I will be around to answer questions. All right, I'll stop there. Thank you. It's up to them. We'll be here till like thirty. So it's entirely up to them. Um, they might even, they can fiddle with the code. They can ask us like questions about like the, the different like lines of code. They just want to understand it better. Um, it's basically like I mean, it's their, it's their time. And we'll, just, yeah, we'll be around for another half hour. So, um, so well, it just depends. Like. It, it honestly just depends what they want to get out of it. If they want to sit here and like work on it, they can. But um, yeah, whatever you think is right. Right. So, so you guys can like leave like Italy on the door. I'd say so, yeah. Unless like, unless they have people have questions, you know, they might not let us leave. So, yeah. Basically, it's just like, we're just happy to, well, we're just here for like, and to be like a resource to everyone here. Um, so it's just sort of entirely up to you guys. Do you need to, to leave here? Yes. No, no, we don't. Like, you can leave as much time as you want. Okay. Yeah. I'm just wondering, like, when, when <laughs> See you later. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if there's a line of students here asking a question, then we'll just stay until that line is gone. Well, I can't speak for Greg probably. Yeah, yeah. He's playing all the way to Singapore to like to, to see students. So, yeah. Totally fine, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sometimes students feel more comfortable like coming up and talking to us rather than maybe putting their hand up. Yeah. That sounds good. Thanks, Telfi. This is actually quite good, I think. For like the, um, the lecture room. Yes, sir.